Hello, everyone. Uh, I guess you're going to have to close the door. <laughs> All right. So, hey, I'm Chuck Lynch. I'm with the AERA. AERA is the Engine Rebuilders Association. Uh, we're a trade association. We're 100 years old this year. Um, we provide technical information to automotive machine shops, and um, we try to we do tech and skills regionals. And some of the information here today is kind of some of the things that we do regionally across the country. Um, these three fellows here are my friends that uh, I've worked with in the industry a long time. Uh, Randy, I would say, man, I went to the welding school a long time ago, and. And Russ, I've known him since he was at Federal Mogul. He was a piston design engineer for 23 years, right? Managed that program. And then Dan, he comes from a lot of racing background. Um, and most recently, you did what, 17 seasons with Ralph Shades? 13. But anyway, a lot of talent up here. So we have a topic that we could be here all day for, right? Failure analysis. We're only going to be able to dust the surface of this. Um, we're going to have some uh, scenarios here that have been provided, and I'll throw those out and let the guys kind of elaborate on the uh, scenario that we have. Um, and with that, I'll get to the first slide. We could get going again because. I mean, just pistons alone, we could be here for four hours easily. So anyway, um, I think if you have questions, um, kind of the turnover time in between, if we can get those, we can definitely handle you know, some questions. Um, I'm moderator, so I'll run around with the mic, put your hands up, and we'll see what we can do and how many we can get answered in, in our amount of time. Um, Anyway, so here is a failure analysis manual that we actually publish, and everyone sitting up here on the panel has contributed to this. Um, and I'll have some more examples later, but it's everything from gasket failures, pistons, bearings, rings, valve train, castings. Um, so there's a lot of good content here. So if you were to swing by our booth and you want to take a closer look at it, um, we sell these books individually or with membership it comes with it and we have like seven other manuals. Um, I know there's quite a few members in here so they can tell you about it too. How much are they? <clears throat> that book's 45 bucks to, to buy outright. So. All right, so this is our uh, first setup scenario here, and uh, it was a failure that Dan was approached about um, to to evaluate. So again, trying to uh, build the case and better understand what's truly going on. Um, a lot of times, things are much different superficially than once you dig into it. So I'll turn it over to Dan. Great. Well, well, thank everybody for coming. I know it's a busy show. Uh, it means a lot to see everybody you know, coming here, taking time out. Hopefully you can take away something from this. Um, I'm not a sit down guy, so I have to stand up to, to talk. But this particular one, it was a, is a complaint that came in, it was a failure. And the, comp the failure f was a spun rod bearing. Okay, so in, in going through this, there's, there's more to it. If you look in the, the first picture is a main bearing. Um, there's a lot of contamination in there. So typically speaking, 50% of bearing failures are contamination. Contamination could be anything from ambient dust, dirt, uh, honing stones, grinding chips, you name it. All right. the, the interesting thing is on, on this particular bearing, you could see how the contamination affected the oil film. Right, is it had enough disruption in the oil film to not have a suitable pressure to go to the rod journals themselves. So the bearing, the, the original problem was the contamination. 
the total failure mode was a spun rod bearing. And the progression to get that, if you look at the, the, the next two pictures are rod bearings. You can see the, the one on the left, is the, sub, the overlay is gone. It's down to the substrate. You can see a little bit of the overlay in there, a little grayish tint. All right, so that's, at that point, we lost all film. The, the overlay came off. So the next bearing is more bronze. You can see the black in it. So the black, if you look at a bearing and you see this black in there, that is oil that has been superheated and coked into the bearing. So that black is discoloration of the bearing to the point that now it's, it's heating the, the substrate to a point that it's melting it out, which is the third example. So once the, once the bearing starts melting, the substrate is copper tin lead, typically. Uh, if it's a, there's two types of substrates. There's a sintered, which is a uh, copper tin lead that's just powdered, heated, and squeezed. And there's a cast, which is, creates copper tin, which the two elements melted, make an alloy of bronze. So it's a much stronger, either way, the components melt to the point that the bearing on the right is actually the spun bearing where the, it just strips off everything out of it. So the customer came in, uh, failure mode was a spun rod bearing. What caused the rod bearing? So as an engine builder, you look at it, it's like, well, you know, what happened here? Well, again, 50% of the bearings that fail are, are contamination. The, the first bearing gave the sign of what happened. The first bearing was just contamination because the oil always goes, typically, unless it's a massive cat a catastrophic failure, will always go from main to rod. I have seen cases on the NASCAR side. I did 27 years of it. I was a reliability engineer at Roush Yates for nine years. I have seen it go the other way, but it's a catastrophic failure. Um, so typically, that is, that is the progression. 50% of the bearings is if people are looking at it and they say, oh, my bearing spun. Well, you got to walk it back to why that happened. And it was not an error of, you know, the, the system. It was, it was some kind of contamination. Now, that's where that comes from is to be determined. So the picture on the left, the same two bearings. Again, you can see the the difference you can see a little clear the the bearing on the right has a little bit of overlay it's not quite as worn um left has coking oil in there all right so the progression steps those same two bearings now i have them paired up side by side notice how one is the the free span what we'll call it the free span is is shorter all right, that's the, typically the one that when you pull it out and it falls out of the rod cap. All right, so when that happens, there's enough heat that the metal in the, the backing of the bearing gets heated. And typically speaking, when that happens, the bearing will close on itself. So that catastrophe, that makes the problem even worse because now a bearing is designed as, as eccentricity, which is basically an oil wedge. So. If the, the door back there, for example, if you put a wedge underneath the door, in this case, it's the oil. If you put a wedge underneath the door, it's trying to lift the journal, lift the door up. That's the same way a bearing works. So as oil goes in, it's a wedge. So as oil goes in, the crank is bringing oil from this volume of the wedge to get the journal off the shaft. Once that journal hits the shaft, you develop frictional heat, which is what happened here. At that point, the bearing starts to close itself in. Now that wedge is gone, and it's conforming to make a round shell going around the journal. Catastrophic failure. So again, you know, to, to sum it up, it's like you may see a failure, but that is not maybe maybe a secondary problem to what has actually transpired to get to that point. All right, any questions on this segment? Sir. Short 
thing being hammered on? Can you ask that again? Again, the recording. Could the bearing shell be uh, collapsed because of the contact between the crankshaft and the bearing, making it uh, suck in like you take a piece of steel and hit it with a hammer, a ball peen hammer? How would it make a slight U? Technically, no, it can't. Now, you can get a hammer mark and you can see like a detonation or something like that happen, and you get a specific wear point on it but it will not collapse it in because as a bearing's design, there's a standoff on the bearing, which is a dimension that is longer than the circumference of the housing board it's in. So as it's, it's clamped in that standoff, when the, when the cap is put on, it's, it's put together and it puts pressure all the ways around to keep the bearing from spinning, right? because that's the that's how the bearing is designed so at that point it can't come in because the force of the bearing by clamping it is forcing it out the pressure is automatically pushing out 360 outwards so if you hit it hard enough this way it will never spring in Thank that's you. a great question <laughs> And again, it we'll be around afterwards if anybody has questions, some catches later. Um, I am in the, the Molly Clevite booth, 1601. Feel free to swing by as well. All right. So we're going to set up a scenario here for Russ. And, and what they had, so in his environment, uh, a production engine rebuilder, uh, we had a situation where, you know, a customer complaint is about um, oil consumption. And so the scenario, you know, kind of, they have a, a uh, customer service team and they're gonna communicate with their end customer and then they ask you know a battery of questions and and that's the challenge that we sometimes have honestly is getting the right questions answered right so this actually even kind of plays out a little bit like that they have, seem to have a little bit of an issue trying to get some questions answered so we make some bad decisions while the engine's still in the vehicle ultimately the damage was done um, so by the time they get the engine back you know, we've probably wasted some efforts doing a repair that had zero value because of the damage was already done. But again, trying to, that communication back and forth with the customers is such a challenge. And uh, I got something more to say about that at the end that we all need to work on. But so the, at the end of the day, after the failure analysis was done, um, it's a, a dusted engine, which oftentimes uh, people don't believe even happens in a modern engine, right? You know, the way the systems are set up, it just can't happen. There's a lot of scenarios that, you know, oh, you can't have bad fuel. Um, see Kurt back there, we just, we had a presentation earlier in the year. You can't have bad fuel. That's, a, that's an old wives tale thing. It, it's not. So dusted engines, it, it's a true scenario. So Russ, can you kind of explain what the w indications are on a dusted engine, how you would tell that apart from just any other dirt? Well, usually when you, is this on? Usually when, uh, can you crank this stuff up? Crank it, is that okay? It is on. It is on. There you go, I'll just do this. Uh, there's a lot of scenarios, you know, when you end up looking at an engine failure analysis, what you really want to do is try to find the root cause. And it's really easy to find a secondary damage or a third damage and you think that is a problem. But we still see dusted engines. We see a lot of, for example, V10 Tritons out on the West Coast and West area that we still come in dusted. One thing you want to see if you do have a dusted engine, you know where it's coming from. It's coming from the top end. So if you have a dusted engine, you're going to look at the top land. And if you look at the picture on the right, you can see where there is scoring on the top land. Probably, uh, 
You got to see where the ingestation of uh, dirt is, fuel is. You'll also notice if it is ingested uh, from the intake system, from whatever that you've got, not lack of air filtration, you will find out that the top ring will be polished pretty well smooth. There's a lot of times when you'll look at the top ring and that's really what you want to take a really good look at too. You'll see that the top is polished and the top shouldn't be polished. I mean, if you've got a ceiling engine, the bottom is where you're going to have wear at, not the top. But if I've got ingestation coming in, then you've got a lot of debris that's coming from the top end and it's coming to the top ring. It's going to wear the top ring quite a lot. And as long as there's still crosshatch in the cylinder wall before it goes down, those rings will continue to spin, and you'll find out that even the... Uh, the radial wall, the actual thickness will actually start to vary, you know, where it's worn. And then it comes out to the very edge where it comes out a little bit where it doesn't touch the groove. So that's going to tell you just right off the bat that you've got ingestation from some type of dirt and debris. Um, and you can also look, the second land will show it. But as soon as you lose the top ring, you can kind of forget it because now you're talking about blow by and it's never going to seal. It's just going to continue to get worse. It's going to continue to polish. It's going to polish your cylinders. And then you look at the striation that's on the truss face, and you can end up seeing that that's just not dust. That's actually fuel. So you've washed down the cylinder wall that way, and you got striations due to the fuel because the top ring stopped at sealing. Uh, you can also look sometimes uh, if you get one that's not quite this bad, you can also see how much you've leaked down and look at the second ring. If you look at the second ring and the second ring bottom is worn quite a bit, that means I got a lot of blow by top, at my top ring and the second ring is trying to seal the combustion. So you'll also see the same thing wear off uh, on the second ring. If everything is running good, you're, uh, where you don't have dust or, or any type of debris, your top ring is going to be sealed on the bottom only, not the top. It'll be on the bottom on the outside. That has to seal first before you can build up enough pressure uh, behind the ring to push it out to the cylinder wall. So there should not really be any type of uh, wear mark on the top. So if I pull apart uh, a piston and I've already got my top ring, it's kind of polished on the surface, you know, you already got debris and it's going the wrong way. And the same thing if you had a good running engine, your second ring's oil ring. So realistically, you don't want wear on the bottom, you'll have wear on the top from the scraping action. So that'll also show you. Any questions or comments? No, not really. If I've got ingestation, I, I'm still going to have it. It depends how long they run it uh, before they wear down. You know, it's kind of like when I lose the seal of blow-by, you get those striation marks on the skirt, um, and that's secondary. Your first problems are the, top, are the rings. And what you'll end up seeing, the longer you run, the more striations. What it's telling you... You've got fuel. You've got fuel, and you've got oil on the wall. So it is just it's it's overheated. So that's why you get a striations instead of a big scuff or a score or pull out marks. Anything else? Yeah. Yes, sir. I had a uh, FE Mazda engine from a uh, lift truck come in and piston did not look too bad, but the ring, the top ring was worn uh, thickness wise about halfway yeah. through yes, and the ring end gap was like three eighths of an inch, almost half inch. So you could see that the radial thickness was gone, but what, what caused the, the wear on the bottom of the ring? If you have, you know, you see this in a couple of combinations. Uh, if, if you didn't have this type of scenario and it's only the top ring and it's worn down, you still could have in a, in a diesel especially, you can end up still having debris in the top ring. 
and as it rotates, it can end up wearing that down quite a bit, and then your side clearance goes crazy. Uh, your gap shouldn't have increased, uh, or not that much. You, your gap would have to increase because your outer surface of your top ring would have to wear quite a bit to make your gap go like that. So I would kind of question that first installation to begin with. Now, there's also an issue you can see on other uh, rings that really get thin uh, at the axial height, and you can see where they go out. If that's not debris, you'll also find out that if your crosshatch pattern is uh, too steep, that'll rotate the rings too fast. And that also do, does come back to the piston uh, manufacturer too. How much uh, actual clearance, side clearance do you have between the groove and the ring itself? If you have excessive, that causes a lot of that too. You get a lot of bouncing and a lot of turning. That. What about the direct injection stuff when you have like a buildup of carbon on the top of the pistons and around the ring lane area? Yeah, on the back of the bowel faces and all that wonderful stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been in the business since 85 and making pistons and I've been a racer a lot of my life. And uh, I can tell you that I didn't think I would come to the place where that the pistons would actually, or the engines would actually be weaker and consuming more oil than they do now. So an OEM wise, you see a lot of these things, they're kind of designed to use for the horsepower and the EPA and the fuel economy. And that's it, they're in the wars. They just want to get past the warranty issue. Well, what you don't see is what they gave up as far as durability, as far as rings, uh, as far as ceiling, and as far as a cylinder wall. Uh, that's why at Jasper, our biggest thing that we have customer complaints on now is oil consumption. Uh, OEM-wise, um, let's say 10, 15 years ago, we wouldn't remanufacture an engine unless it was eight years out. Now we're having requests and we're remanufacturing as well. I just finished the Godzilla 2020. So we're not getting that for the three year warranty. There's a problem. And it, it usually all goes around oil consumption. Well, if I consume oil and I only have a direct injection and I don't have a port injection to clean off that valve, you're going to continually build up enough to where you ruin the ceiling. And you know, in the, in the early days of the direct injection when they did this and they didn't have port injection, they had walnut blast and people doing this at 80,000 miles trying to get the carbon off the back of the valves. Well, the problem is it wasn't designed correctly. And I'm gonna tell you, most of it is in the piston and the ring. They use such a uh, low tension oil ring and in, uh, for an example, a 3.6 General Motors V6 uses a 1.5 millimeter three-piece oil ring. Tension is around four pounds when you check it. it. You also look at the pistons and there's really no oil drain backs for it. And when you look at that situation, well, this is terrible. Now, remember, years ago you had a V6, you had four or five quarts of oil. Now you have six or more. Look at the high ethanol content we have, which likes to draw moisture into the crankcase. Look at the vehicles that are not getting warmed up enough and have enough highway miles to burn off that condensation. And then couple it with people telling you OEM-wise, don't change your oils for 7,500 miles or 10,000 miles, or we'll do your oil changes. What happens is, we get several cores in that even as early as 30,000 miles, that oil ring is already stuck. It's sludged. There's no oil that can hardly get through it, and the oil that you end up having since it won't go through it because they have no drain backs or very little drain back, and there's very little to go back there, the oil does not circulate. And then if you let it continue to go, it just sticks. That's why you'll see maybe a Chrysler Pentastar They'll say it's 1,500 miles a quart, 
till 50,000 miles after 50,000 miles is 750 miles a quart. When you see uh, engines such as maybe a Subaru, they don't consider it excessive until you get over less than 500 miles a quart. When you look at Audi and BMW and some of it, it's down to 400 miles a quart. Audi will actually give you, or no, BMW will actually give you a really fancy uh, Velcro thing to put your oil in your trunk. <laughs> Some of the uh, Mercedes, you'll even look at some of when you flip it open to put gas in, it'll say, check oil before fueling. Now, how many people check oil these days? Or even know where to check oil? Yeah. And so what you end up getting is, you know, I did a, a Dodge uh, 6.4 not too long ago, and we, re we, we redesigned pistons, rings, and all that type of stuff, so we don't have that. So... What I found out, that was the most coke engine I found that did not uh, seize up. Well, it has eight quart capacity, but I'm gonna tell you, I had so much coking to it, even when I pulled, uh, took apart the, the, the main bolts, I had coking inside my main bolts. And that's one of the first times I've ever seen anything that bad. So what happens with people if it doesn't, doesn't go? Well, they don't check their, their fuel, their oil consumption a lot of times. They'll take it to somebody else and change their oil. These guys are not going to tell you, hey, I only drained four out, and I'm putting eight in. And we see a lot of that. I hope that answers your questions. These engines today are meant for economy and fuel, and they give up durability. Yes, you got one here, Russ. Okay. Uh, Russ, my question is more in uh, the performance side than the, than the rebuild side, but I'm curious about um, as our axials keep getting smaller and smaller, um, one of the things that we constantly check is the dimensions of the ring groove, and, and occasionally we run into issues with taper yep. where the front of the groove is bigger than the back of the groove. So talk a little bit about what the consequence of that is and what's uh, too much or not, you know, not acceptable. Uh, anything over five tenths is unacceptable, and you got to have a minimum of a zero tilt. But we put our pistons in with an up tilt always. You really want to up tilt on your top groove because as the piston heats up, it goes down. And so I want to have that top ring and that outer surface of that bottom groove to touch immediately. Another problem that you'll end up finding is uh, actual side clearance. There's a lot of aftermarket, and there's a lot of people that put a lot, of, a lot of side clearance to begin with. Many of them will put two thousandths minimum, and they may run three and a half thousandths. You can't do that. And you also got to remember with the shorter pistons and all these things that you do that way, and the smaller rings, those rings make the piston stable especially at top dead center as you're coming down on the power stroke. So what you do not want to do is have excessive side clearance where they can come off. Uh, our specifications, um, I design all the pistons uh, of the new applications and rings. Uh, so our specifications on the ring group, we hold it a thousandths minimum. We have uh, up tilt of uh, four tenths per inch. We have... Uh, Maximum of five tenths variation. So if I have any any tilt that's bottom or negative, you're going to consume oil. So it's extremely important, but people don't know how to measure that. The waviness of the groove can only be a thousandths total indicator reading, and you don't want any more than four tenths in a 60 degree area, or the ring won't sell. And that gets worse depending on the type of ring and the the uh, actual thickness of the ring. That makes sense. Knowing that the uh, the rings are not sealing nearly as well, I've seen quite a few people uh, coming in with like catch cans and stuff like that. Is that more of a band-aid for the situation or is that something that actually helps to prevent that coking of the, the valve train? on uh, modern day DI motors. So let me understand this. So you've got one that's consuming oil on your rings and you, uh, I missed a word there. 
I've been seeing a lot of our customers with uh, higher performance DI motors yeah. that are uh, trying to add like a catch can or something like yep. that to to control that yes. oil consumption. Yes. Is that something that's a benefit or is there more of a... It's a benefit. Okay. Uh, like a lot of the Dodge Hemis and some of the systems we get a lot from uh, state police and things like that that have a high idling time. Uh, the PVC system uh, has a problem sometimes on actually pulling oil. So you put a catch can on that system and you will use less oil. And you'll see how much that you're actually using to begin with. So a catch can is a good, a good thing. Actually, and, and in my opinion, some cars need to come out with a catch can that has a problem. Uh, backing up just a little bit, uh, the tilt that you were talking about in the ring lands. Um, yes, sir. You're refer when you were referring it to be negative, the outside of the ring land is narrower than the inside of the ring land? No. Uh, our groove will not vary any more than probably one to two tenths all the way across, and that has to be a positive tilt. Normally, we see no more variation than one tenth. And normally it should be zero. If you got a clean tool and you're cutting and you set it up right and you're not trying to gouge, then you're not going to have that boat out. Expand on that a little bit. If you look at the, like the ring grooves are going to be tilted up. And then when you have thermal expansion due to heat, they're actually going to start to lay down. So the, the crown of that piston is growing up in height. So if they start out, they're flat or slightly down, you're in real trouble, especially your second ring, which is usually taper face. So then it's going to go straight to the crankcase. Is this it? All right. So um, what sometimes the uh, like dusting might look like detonation sometimes yes um how can we like decipher which one because sometimes no, the nothing, top yeah which one went first yeah like because sometimes it'll look like the whole top like ringland is just dusted and, like somebody blasted it uh this type of condition if you continue to run it can lead to detonation easy because you got more oil going in your combustion chamber and detonation can be a secondary cause if i have enough detonation to begin with then you're going to see some type of breakage or heat areas or cracks to go with and you probably will not you will not get to this type of situation especially with your second land still being intact if I've got hard enough detonation to cause me a problem, your first area that should break is going to be your second ring land on your major thrust side. Because that's where all the power goes to. That's where it's a hammer effect of, uh, you know, 10 to 15 fold pressure. And that what usually breaks. Just an example, I'll give you an example. 3.5 three, three EcoBoost did a lot of research before we made a 3.5 EcoBoost piston because 3.5 EcoBoost, when it first came out, it had a lot of preignition and a lot of detonation. And you wonder, well, how can you end up, you know, doing this? Well, looked at it really hard, and, and what OE did for the first year, they didn't do, they didn't anodize the top groove. You anodize the top groove to stop micro welding, to make it harder. You know, anodization is just a controlled oxidation of aluminum. So when you get controlled oxidation of aluminum, if you've ever seen a piece of aluminum that's been outside and you got it white, if you, know, if you ever know that you scraped on it, it's extremely hard. So that stops ring micro welding. Well, guess what? Ford was breaking their second land a lot. We had a lot of cores come in. So the next year and a half, they went ahead and they anodized the top groove. Guess what? The top groove still micro welding and it was still breaking the second land through detonation. The fourth year they came out and they put a basically RGP, a steel uh, inserted uh, ring carrier, just like a diesel piston to stop the ring land breakage. But they didn't fix what the problem was. The problem was they had so much pressure and heat 
it goes down and the top ring is, is going to take 60 to 70 percent of your heat out to transfer to the cylinder wall. So what was happening, they put a 1.2 millimeter in there and they had it high. And what was happening, it's overheating. The ring was overheating and couldn't transfer enough heat. So it was sticking. Now, Ford stopped their problem with the second land breakage with the diesel uh, ring groove in there. But the problem was they didn't change the ring or the location. So your next failure would be you just have score top rings. So what we did, we made a Ford's piston and we lowered the ring pack. We anodized the top and the grooves and the crown. Uh, I put a 1.5 millimeter, really good steel. I had 33% more surface area, so I can transfer about that much more heat to it. And plus, since I've had it down and it was a forging and it was anodized, I'll probably be running 130 degrees less on that piston head. So when you do all that, then you don't have a problem, so we didn't have a detonation issue. So Ford had a new engine that was detonating. If you look at it, it's just because they took too much out of the ring. So guess what? I just got through doing the EcoBoost 2, Gen 2. Ford went to a 1.5 millimeter ring. So kind of cured that problem. Any personal opinion on the new gas porting of the rings? Uh, gas porting of the rings. I was asked to look at that a few years ago from one of the executives because, you know, they're, you got to see what industry you're looking at. Are you looking for racing or you're looking for... Yeah, high-performance racing. Okay, high-performance racing is a good deal. I uh, used to do a lot of NASCAR stuff. And uh, gas port usually, uh, lateral on the sides, you don't want to do it on the top. You get enough pressure on some of those to make sure that you have no problem to push out. But again, it does you no good if you don't have the bottom sealed. The problem that we always ran into with the gas port when we would just do the vertical holes in the piston is no matter what, when we would pressure the motor up over the downtime, there would be a couple holes that would be plugged. Yep. So then it's doing it uneven because some of them are plugged from cars. And you don't do it on top. You, you do it on sides. Yeah. You always do it on the sides. The top side only. Uh, they got rings. I know Total Steel has rings. It's actually carved in there to do that now. But the top ports, that's kind of old school when they first did it, but that's no good. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't continue to work. Yes, sir. On a ring land? On the uh, groove. On uh, the groove yeah. surface. A groove surface. Okay. I will not take any more than a two tenths difference. Ours usually run between zero and one. If they're grooving right, the only reason you have a problem with that, they didn't have their setup right when they grooved it, or they're trying to groove it and not have enough lubrication when they groove it and it's heating up. My question is how do you measure it? Uh, because uh, a four inch pin won't go in a four inch hole. Uh, I go ahead and we measure it. I've got groove blocks with intents, so I can measure all that. And then when I get to the surface, I also got a little uh, dial indicator that's 50 millionths that I can zero it out and, and go over. And then on top of that, we got a, a corded measure machine that's accurate within 20 millionths. If we got a question, we can do that. But your two tenths issue is. It, is not a problem. Your problem is going to be when you got a negative. You should never really have a wedge type groove. And that's what it sounds like is happening. That's a manufacturing defect. All right, thank you. In an effort to keep things moving along, we're going to Sorry. jump into some balancing stuff here. If any of you have a question for me later, if you can find me, I'd be glad to talk to you. I am trying to. Leave some. All right, let's see what Chuck's put up there. Is that working? Yes. Okay, good. All right, how does the vibration 
present itself to the engine builder? Does it feel the complaint? How can we, you ensure that the part is safe for use after identifying there was likely an out of bounds condition? All right, well, let's understand a couple things first. There, there's a local saying that's going around now that simply says, we don't know what we don't know. And everything that we've learned in our engines now is that we're now making either more horsepower than the system can sustain. And as such, this just happens to be a harmonic damper of a 6.4 diesel. And if you take notice right around the clamp area, you're gonna see metal exchange. The way that takes place is because the damper or the force created by torsional load has caused a friction weld or metal exchange. So do you understand that? Quite frankly, you had to get to about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Think about that. That's a dull red if you want to use a gauge block. Now, it's not just single to this type. It can also be a slip fit. It go right over the snout. There's a whole bunch of reasons, but we go to cause and effect. And basically, power is being generated from racing, by over-the-road trucks. It doesn't matter, but it's all torsional related. The damper, its mission statement by primary design is to control that uh, torsional event. In other words, it's a twisting action. Think of it as sort of a beer can effect. Now, in this particular case, how would you fix that? The first thing is, the guy who takes the engine apart, he's your ace. He's the number one guy that should be looking at this. When he sees this, a fire alarm should go off, and he should be talking to someone down the chain to say, look, we got an issue. There's the problem, how do we fix it? That's testifying to me there's more power being made than the dampener's ability to control. Now, there's a couple of remedies there. One of them would be to change the fastener type. By the way, when you take that unit and you take your little Ziz wheel with a uh, scotch Sprite and you run over it and you put it back on, that's not the remedy. <laughs> so what we want to understand, cause and effect, if you put that same dampener in the same horsepower making unit, you're just gonna be you know, seeing it again. Now you're not gonna see it because it left the building, but it's gonna come back short of its normal life cycle. Worse yet, it could be a short term cause that, that damper, by the way, we'll talk about it real quick on dampers. Once we buy a new one and we put it into service, it's degrading at that point. In other words, it's not like wine that gets better with age, <laughs> all right? When you put a damper in place, it's automatically going south. Now, depending upon the integrity or design, we'll give you some tenure, if you will, but we'll get guys, especially long running engines at 100, 200, 300,000 miles, and the guy takes it off and puts it back on. Now, I already just testified that it didn't get better. It went south. And so when you put it on, the ability of it to control its primary principle of design, gone. Now, the torsional event has linkage to the entire operations of the engine. In other words, if that engine is not being controlled, it's deteriorating. Now, it doesn't just affect torsionally. It affects everything related, and we call it fretting. That's what you're seeing right there. But believe it or not, it'll go right to the head gasket surface. And some industrial engines will see end phase gasketing. And it'll be, we call it fretting again, but you'll see this as sort of a pitting action on all mating surfaces, not necessarily combustion. You'll see it main caps. You'll see the fit of it. Do we have a picture of that? All right, so here's a good example right here. Now, this is an industrial application, and you can see there's a local dial there that's a register, but if you'll see the step, that's, this happens to be off a 3500 series CAT engine, but what's happening is that register has now been marginalized by about eight thousandths of a step. Now, remember, when we bolted these counterweights on, they were supposed to be mated and captured, but over time, you'll see, once again, additional fretting and deformation. What happens is that whatever clamp force is there went away. And for any of you guys that play with big diesel stuff, those units weigh somewhere around 80 to 150 pounds. And when they come off, you find them in the next zip code. They literally go through the block, ventilate it, and it's just it's an unhealthy. And by the way, on a dyno room, really a bad day. <laughs> So where we're at with this, we got one more of that, or is that the last one you got? Okay, so here's a deal, sort of interesting. What's important is, this is an example here on big stuff, but by proper balance, right, and proper torsional control, 
those engines are now exceeding 100% of normal duty cycle. Why? Machining tolerances were good, flatness was there, but more importantly, the damper's mission was back to OEM start point, not end of life point. It's very important. Any damper that you put on an engine, I don't care race car or not, they have limited cycles, all right? Uh, in the performance world, let's see, we, that's the last one on that one, right? Okay, let me talk real quick on that with the torsional deal. And the race cars, you guys, let's call it drag racing for a minute. You're not out there very long. But we are seeing excessive torsional events that will cause, in some cases, we're seeing that literally the elastometer melt after a single pass. Now, I got to tell you, that's not a durability issue. This thing is just screwed up. That's the best way I can tell you. That's a technical term, by the way. <laughs> so when we get to understand that, you have to go back now and look at durability, because that's what torsional control is, and also first order balance. We're going to be talking about that tomorrow with Dan. But at any rate, what I'm getting to here is, if you don't, if, when you take that engine apart, the smartest guy in the room is your teradyne guy. You need to kiss his ring, because he's going to save you bucks making sure it doesn't come back. OK? Any questions? I got one to kind of start with. All right. I think. Uh, <clears throat> so in these parts that see high duty, in, in the performance world, we usually age th something out. I did this many cycles and we age it out. Um, you know, Dan, I know you've done some of this stuff in the past. So how do we as a, a group that does repair want to use things over? Okay, I have something that's in a, uh, application that we know we've determined okay there was a vibration situation so I want to fix it so based on the amount of cycles and so forth how do you inspect that accurately to make sure that I have something I can fix you know we can fix those surface finish areas but what about all the torsion load that's been applied to it has it been cycled out should we trust those those parts Okay, I'm going to give two answers, and I'm going to go to the accuracy of, of measurement. Uh, probably don't have one. In other words, it's all case by case. I've got a 500 cubic inch engine, I've got a 250 cubic inch engine, or I have a 100 horsepower engine and I have a 5,000 horsepower engine. You can't match up any profile that's equivalent. Now, the primary design from the manufacturers, that's your first go-to. They'll give you some steering currents, but I'm going to tell you, when we bring them into racing specifically, that's called best guess, right? Uh, the guys that come in that want to make claim that this is absolute, I would talk to another manufacturer, you know, because there is no science to this in the sense of application. Now, I can sit there in math and tell you exactly what's going to happen until you start the ignition. And then it's going to be, let's talk about durability, road racing. Or better yet, Dan would be better to pick up on this. If you change the last armor, the O-rings in the, some of these units, you're going to find that those ha will change with the rommer base. Dan, pick up on that. Yeah, we, exactly what we're talking about. Um, I was in charge of the reliability at Roush Yates and product, creating that cycle count. Based off track time, where we were at, what, what happened situation was, and what part it was, and what was the manufactured part was changing of the cycle time, what spec the engine was. So to Randy's point, you know, where it's at, what components you're using, um, what anomaly happened to that engine would change what we would allow cycle count on. Um, to Randy's point on there, also the uh, with the fretting and so forth, we had different durometer O-rings that we would create to uh, to make the best RPM range to make that engine happy. You can't make it happy in all RPM ranges, but we would sp specifically pick. And once we got that, we get our cycle count better because we reduced fretting that was happening. Uh, we would how many O-rings, uh, what durometer o-rings they were what the material of the o-rings were all that was relative to go with what randy was showing there with with the fretting which then increases the cycle count because it decreases the the specific wares on it so from failure analysis i think you know something that share with the whole group is you know russ spoke about root cause analysis and that's what we should try to 
do with what we learn in failure analysis. Otherwise, it's just disassembly, right? So evaluate the stuff as it comes down and try to make changes that make you not see this again. We said coked oil about four times, right? So when we coke oil, we basically turn it to glass, right? What's glass? A very poor conductor. It's a good insulator. It's a really poor conductor. So when we have these oil changes that we know that we see oil coking, the engine's cooking itself, and now we have even more heat being kept in the parts because it can't transfer it out, you know, flow across the bearings and so forth. Um, so, yeah, it's just, again, this is the thing that you, uh, what can I do from what I learned in failures to build my parts better? So. For instance, that piston, if you didn't fix root cause, what do you do? You change it to a different fuse. There's always gonna be a fuse. If, I don't, if the piston don't break, then I beat the rod bearing out. If the rod bearing doesn't beat out, then I blow the head gasket. You gotta get to root cause. Uh, anybody else, any questions for the panel here at any topic? On the balancer, um, did you guys just stay with like an OEM because you were referring to O-rings versus like a Rattler design or a fluid ampner on the, the NASCAR road race motors? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, get a little more detail on that. Uh, in the NASCAR, the only balancer that was SAE approved was ATI. So we were required to run an ATI dampener. Now size, um, Thickness was packaging. Uh, certain applications we ran bigger balancers than others. Certain um, applications we ran more mass weight inside the internals. And then we had Viton, Arbuna. Um, and typically speaking, uh, you know, tomorrow we had some data on balancers on, on Brandon and I's presentation. Uh, but, you know, we, we would see dampeners specific ATIs and we have pictures tomorrow as so OEM dampeners where they're they're fracturing well when that's fracturing it's actually uh, reducing the dampening qualities but the engine's still requiring the dampening qualities so the pictures Randy was showing up the fretting is because either one it wasn't right or two is decrease its dampening range and made it minimal to create a bigger issue than it had. And when you said that you changed thickness or diameter for RPM for something higher RPM, were you guys making it smaller or making it bigger? Do you remember by chance? So the higher RPMs, and, and there's some of the acceleration that we, we got into also, um, it, it was holding the, it wasn't the specific Daytona Talladega was a bigger dampener, more mass weight, because it was a sustained momentum of inertia. Um, smaller tracks via mile and a half were mid-range. Um, and then if you we went to Martinsville, which was a lot of, the, the range of RPM was a lot higher. Uh, that was very light, because you don't stay in that residence for a long period of time. It's very quick through it. So it was easier to dampen something that's quick through it than something that is a slow acceleration curve to it. It's very relative. Yeah. You got to understand where we're coming with this is that one. Hold it, hold it closer. Again? Okay, here we go. You got to understand that the case by case is what dictates the application. Uh, a lot of it is through experimentation, but your first go-to is go back to OEs. Now, there's a lot of different manufacturers out there. They're all pretty good guys, pretty smart guys. I don't think anybody builds a bad piece, but you need to be very specific with your application. Uh, the one thing that I've enjoyed watching the industry sort of come to a, a point that we've turned perception as not the mainstream of what we should do. We now want to be a little more analytical. I'm going to love this part. We're starting to do a deep dive on, on this. And so we're starting to find out that what we, don't, what we think we know, we don't know. Yeah. And so the biggest problem with this is that the ability to make power, you know, we got all you people in here, you know, 100 plus people, you don't, none of you do the same thing, all right? 
So we got to, when everybody comes in, and I made the statement earlier, I didn't mean that in a mean-spirited way, no one has the answer for you until you pass along the data. And then, and this is the, the issue, you have to have the ability to test it. You know, we have spintrons now, we have super dynos, we have racetrack response, uh, gauging on site. Uh, this is good data. And uh, it's critical for us to learn from. And uh, by the way, what worked yesterday, probably not gonna work tomorrow. Just, you know, we gotta accept that. This is a living animal. And we're at a point, where we'll be talking about more tomorrow, but we're breaking stuff. And, and I'm gonna use this word, I hope I don't get chased out of the room for. A lot of it has to be borderline stupidity, okay? So while we're trying to do, we have some, some excellent people here in the audience. So really, there's some, a lot of brain trust in this room that uh, we need to see talking more. We need to start expanding on this data. And uh, like I say, Dan on bearings, you know, he can sit there and read these things and, and I'll look at it and I'll think one thing and I'll hand it over to him and he'll slap me around and get me you know, in the right direction. But the deal is, it's cause and effect. That's where we're at. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Well, who's got the mic? I got the okay. Uh, back, in the, back in the day, like uh, 2005 and 2010, I heard a lot about overbalancing and underbalancing and motors running 9 to 10,000 RPM. Your opinion on over and underbalancing? What's the thing? Opinions are like, nah, I, don't, I can't go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to watch where I go here. Let me tell you this, but I'm going to tell you up front, you're going to talk to me, you're going to be, I'm a 50 percenter, all right? And I've listened to everything out there, and I'm always open to learning. But give me data. Don't give me what you think. Show me. In other words, I can tell you generically that there's a sort of a sweet spot that people want to be in. Oh, wait a minute, 50 percent, right? And then I'll get people who will move outside that boundary. All right, and they'll come back and, and they'll say, this is where it's working, I'm really happy with it, end of story. I said, well, how did you get the data? Well, I wanted to race. It doesn't work. <laughs> That's not a data point, all right? So uh, I'm not saying that we can't learn from applications, but you gotta understand that this overbalance is a first order dynamic only. And we're gonna talk about it more tomorrow. But I, and I don't wanna wear into this, this conversation here, but you gotta understand that's only one part of the equation. That's where I want you, you know, if, tomorrow we're going to talk about how the other orders affect and they work in concert or in chaos. That's the key. And if you uh, think there's one simple answer, it's not. And the individual case of engines, it's, if I made the statement all women are the same, I'd be in a lot of trouble, right? <laughs> okay, there's not a single engine that's the same either. I'm sorry, it's just not there. Now. Unless you're doing cup type stuff and where we vary this is depending upon the track. That's what they've learned before. But I'll also tell you there's some new technology coming that you guys haven't seen yet from different manufacturers. That's what this show's about. Get out there and bend their ear. Talk to them. And uh, there is remedy, but there's not cure. There's a difference. You just got to understand that testing is going to be to find the best solution for application, All right? I think you kind of answered it a little bit, but what if you got like a class that doesn't have a balancer, say IE sprint car or something? Is there a different type of balance or, I mean, other than eight counterweights or whatever, but. Oh boy, here we go. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 the remedy is new bearing, new crank. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I figured I didn't know if there was something yeah. you'd found or not. So. No, no, listen, when you're talking about the 410, 360 group, you know, you guys are on an island all by yourself. Uh, so the deal is, is that you violate everything that we want to try and talk about in torsional control. You do it because you want to accelerate and decelerate, all right? You also don't want to have what we call a gyroscopic effect because you're on the throttle hanging, you know, first of all, you're nuts when you're racing. So. <laughs> But the other side of it is that, you know, everything that you have that you're giving me feedback on, I understand, but I'm also saying there's always a trade-off in making power. Stability being one factor, making adequate power, and then applied power. So again, it's case by case. Now, I totally disagree with not having torsional control on any engine, all right? In fact, I'll just say with the, your group here, if you make it to the end of the year and that crank isn't handed you in two pieces, that's because you go to church a lot. That's all there is to it. 
So you got to understand, if I take those crank NMCs and I put them into a DC Magnaflux, I'll scare the hell out of you. And I'm going to show you that tomorrow. But I'm not saying you're not doing it. But you got to understand, there's no messiah. Once the crank takes the injury, it doesn't get better. Does that help? Yeah, well, uh, yeah. See, there is no answer. Not the answer you wanted, but yeah. No. But uh, listen, I, I would love to have feedback from you. You know, uh, people do tickle the percentage and playing with that. But again, there's a lot of data not not applied. It's more. I think this is the right thing to do. And if if I win the race, I must be smart. You know that kind of stuff. But I'm more analytical. All right. Anybody uh, else? Is the uh the degradation over time on the damper that you're talking about, is that lessened with a viscous damper versus an elastomer? All right, let's do it this way. I don't care what the design of the damper is, it goes and deteriorates the day you apply it. There is no way that it's gonna get better with time, okay? And the guys that are in production, you know, that do this stuff, and they swap out something that's already run an excessive duty cycle, it's called playing Russian roulette, but of course, it's the Polish side because you keep putting bullets in the chamber. You're guaranteed it's going to fail. So you may have already answered this question 50%. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> in a drag and drive situation where we spend, in this, my case, stick shift car, a lot of time driving low RPMs, 15, 16, 17, 1800 RPM going down the highway. But then we're making 1500 horsepower at the track, shifting at 7,000. Is there a solution in between? Because I think we have really different needs on both ends. Yeah, actually we did that. It was called, what was it, crankshaft and new bearings. Oh, That's oh perfect, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. So regular maintenance. Yeah, we, <laughs> like it, it, the bottom line is, let's just be real fair, and, and I'll try and get off the subject. You're making more power than structural integrity allows. And you're going back and you're, a manufacturer is producing a product that's, I don't think, again, anybody makes a bad product, but it was intended for X horsepower, and you guys are ballistic. Right? I mean, you're just right. It, it, and again, we'll talk about more tomorrow, but here's my point, is that if that engine was primary OEM designed for, let's say, 500 horsepower, and you're doing 5,000 horsepower, and you're running smaller journals and smaller bearings and all this, really? You think it's going to live? <laughs> it can't. All right? So all we can do is find compromise. And by the way, there are some solutions. We're going to be talking about that tomorrow. But it's not an answer. We just got to understand, we're, the animal that you guys are playing with, it'll eat you. That's all there is to it. it it'll take you out. But it's fun. <laughs> all right. Uh-oh, can't hear it, Chuck. Okay. So this, this is a, kind of a two-part uh, question for Dan and I guess a statement a little bit more uh, expounding further on the harmonic balancer. So let's say it was an aftermarket. And at what point you have to kind of question yourself, at what point do I not test anymore? What about the parallelism between the harmonic balancer and the snout face? Or what about the fillet radius if it's an aftermarket balancer? Uh, if it was increased, at that point in time, the contact area between the snout, if it's squared off, because we've seen a lot of times you'll get into, I mean, every one of us in here that are engine builders that use uh, aftermarket components will know, OE standards are not necessarily transferred into the parts that we're seeing. So if you have a radius there, at certain points you're having to qualify parts as they're coming through the door. Let's say that that radius and that fillet uh, on, the, on the, uh, the, the balancer and the crank were coming in contact with one another. You don't have a face seating at that point. Now you have a spring contact. Once it loses tension, that fretting starts to begin. So I guess it's a statement of GD&T is so much more going into understanding that as an engine builder really sometimes I think we create more of our problems by not understanding the relationship between everything that's happening too through the aftermarket parts. I think that's pretty much a fair statement in that as well. And the second part for the question for uh, Mr. Dan was, is the surface finish on the rod um, or uh, let's say the surface finish on rods or mains on the, the bore housings themselves. Uh, aftermarket, most of the time you'll see hone. Um, a lot of times you won't see that, especially on rod bearings for the, uh, for the OE. You'll see it's just a board finish. So what's the surface finish that you're looking for on that for the best heat transfer? So great questions. So back to the, 
the balancer, the first part of the question. I mean, any any component you change, um, and and I stand every time and say, look, I'm I'm not a crank manufacturer. You know, there there's some great crank manufacturers present in this room here that can answer questions better on that than I can. But anytime you change the rigidity of the component, mass weight, rigidity of the component, journal size, what structural support it has. Um, you you changed the, the dampening requirements for that engine. Uh, once in, in in my world, prior to come to Mali, uh, you know we, we had a spec engine, and this was the crank we used, and this was the RPM we used. So we pinpointed to to optimize that frequency to that durometer and weight, et cetera, for that. You know, in, th in this world, um, you know, and, and looking out here, I d a lot of you guys, I don't know what you do or whatever, and that, that's a hard thing. Uh, and, and we got support from Ford in doing that to do, to come up with that. And I never forget the first time I saw this chart, I'm like, what the heck is all this? It looks like some kind of disco dance thing going on there. And it's like, I had no idea uh, until much later, you know, the orders of balance and so forth like that. So it, it is a hard, um, you know, the back to the manufacturing of of the dampener and, and going with their spec. And then simply as, as we start, I always say parts don't lie. It's just knowing what they're saying. Uh, looking at it afterwards, are you seeing a lot of heat in, in the parts? Are, are the parts fatiguing enough that the dampener is losing its quality of life much earlier than expected? Um, second part of the question, heat transfer. Um, you know, it's a great question. You get new block in and it, it's it's done two spec maybe not shouldn't be you know that's to be up to the manufacturer uh, as a bearing manufacturer you know we we do not release a print for the surface finish of a housing bore whether it be a rod or a block i will add though um we smooth is not good uh, we, we had some very slick machine surfaces that we did. Uh, typically speaking, uh, particularly a connecting rod, and I will add it was a very high dollar connecting rod. Uh, very high dollar. It was very little. Uh, every connecting rod in as the engine's firing will ovalize twice. It will ovalize on compression and it ovalize on exhaust. So it's pinching itself together every time. Uh, same crush on the bearing, same housing bore, smooth finish, we would actually get the bearing to, to walk because as I mentioned earlier, bearing has standoff, it has hoop strength that pushes out to hold it steady. Uh, prior to what anybody says, the locating lug is strictly a locating lug, it's not anything for rotation. Uh, I have seen bearings with enough torsionals that have moved the bearings front and back and the tang has held it in place where the bearing actually would pivot back and forth. And you can see it by the looking at the front of the radius where we go in. So, you know, th there's, we don't call out a, manuf uh, a specification on that, but there is enough that you don't want it too rough where it it's point loading. You want to, um, it's probably something, you know, I can hopefully collect. We have a Muskegon test lab that I would be, uh, I'm going to dig into this a little bit more. Um, smooth is not good because you do need a grip, but the real cooling of the bearing, as Randy pointed out, he was talking about this, the fretting, and he mentioned 1400 degrees. All right, so that temperature is going back through the crankshaft. All right, so you just look at oil temperature, um, and that's a part of oil temperature. You think of combustion, there's also some fr friction temperature going into that crankshaft, and the point is it has to get the oil to cool that bearing because typically speaking a bearing a tri-mel bearing in a performance world copper tin lead overlays and you're melting the lowest melting component is around 360 degrees all right so you just induced 1400 degrees into the shaft with a 360 degree lowest melting point of the overlay it's not a good recipe right so you need amount of oil to cool the overlay so you need heat to get out, but it's it's like a radiator. You have to flow water through and to cool the engine, you have to flow oil through to, to dissipate the heat out. Well, I think we may have overstayed our welcome here a little bit as far as the clock keepers are. So uh, 
Anyway, thanks everybody for coming out. Thank and you guys, ladies.